Red's Fly Shop. This is Bob. How may I help you today? Look at that. Woo! It's the most amazing rainbow. Can't do it justice on video, but absolutely incredible rainbow chads over there fishing giant trevally walking the edge just about under the rainbow man those are manta rays are huge incredible wow there's two of them they're giant I have very poor luck with trigger fish. They're very spooky. So I'm gonna lead him way out in front and just kind of let my fly drift into him. It's a pretty good cast. I snagged up a moment ago. He's gonna eat it. He just tailed on it. He's gonna eat it. He's gonna eat it. He's following it. He tried to eat it. Got him. Got him. Go I, I've had horrible luck on trigger fish. They're so spooky, but what I do know is you've gotta lead them a lot. And uh Luckily, I'm not in an, a coral area because these trigger fish will just go down in a hole and then you got to dig them out of there. But miraculously, I managed to get one hooked over the sand. Look at this guy. Do not put your finger in there. These critters can bite your finger in half. Look at this fish. Look at that. That thing's crazy looking, Chad. That is great. All right. Look at that guy. Oh, I finally got one. That's the nicest trigger fish I've ever landed. And I, I hope the hookup is on video, but you have to lead these things way ahead. Historically, they're so spooky. And look at those teeth. Oh my gosh. Looks like one of my uncles. Oh, got the trigger, baby. That is too cool. When you unhook these, you have to use pliers. I've, I've heard about guys, let me get my, my pliers here. But I've heard about guys having their pliers get bit in half. Ah, yeah, come on. Yep, broke the hook. That's common with these things. So they'll actually break your hook. They'll actually break your hook uh, while you're trying to release them. But yeah, there's a trigger fish. So. All right, post game interview with the trigger fish. Couple things happened there. One, I was really lucky I was in the sand. I feel like that's the only reason I was able to actually land that fish because they will bore down into a coral hole and get stuck in there and then you, they're just gone unless your guide swims underwater and digs it out of there, which uh, happened yesterday to one of our groups. But that trigger fish also ate the fly like four times. I mean, he just tailed and burrowed in and missed it and tailed and burrowed in. And being extremely diligent on your strip set is super important. It would have been really easy for me to lift my rod tip and I probably never would have got that fish. So trigger fish when you can, lead way ahead of them and then stay down and stay disciplined on that strip set because they might eat it multiple times. The moment we all dream about finally happened for me. I got a perfect op at a huge giant trevally. Short range, like 30 feet. Made a great cast out in front of him. Made a good set. Could have had him really well connected, and that hook just slipped out. I had him freaking pinned. 60 pounder, I mean, four feet long. Oh my gosh.
he came up like this and I just threw a backhander just like that, like two strips into it. He, he ate it and I yanked back, I had him and I go, I was like, oh, here we go. This thing's gonna go for a freaking ride. And uh, he, dude, the hook just came undone, came unbuttoned. And um, I, I had him, I had him and the hook just didn't, didn't stay in for whatever reason. I don't, felt, I don't feel like I did anything wrong. Uh, I mean, he turned and he was starting away and I still had him, you know, he was on. Usually that's like, the, that digs it. You know, you let them set the hook as they make that initial run. But uh, yeah, that just that little backhand flip, you have to be quick. It came up on my two o'clock, was really fast, had my line ready, everything was good. And uh, just didn't, didn't get him stuck. So we're gonna keep walking down this flat right here and uh, just being ready it's like guerrilla warfare it's like in this lower light it's like self-defense it's like man these fish are probably going to be coming at you because the tide is going this way and you've got to be ready to make a very very quick accurate cast and you generally get one shot so don't throw too soon take a deep breath think it through and try to make one good shot oh i'm hoping for a mulligan on that one that was a pretty incredible specimen right there Finally got one coming right at me. That was great. Yeah, that was really great. I've been having a hard time getting these fish and uh, I finally realized that there's just a lot of current. And so I'm having to cast about four feet to what would have been shooters right on that one in order to get. Well, I hit kind of a dry spell and I was having trouble getting hooked up. And I finally started to look at like uh, the sand that my feet were kicking up. And I noticed there was an awful lot of current. And I also noticed I was starting to get a lot of bow in my line. And so my fly, unbeknownst to me, oh, that's a nice healthy bone. All right, unbeknownst to me, my fly was just drifting away from the bonefish. There we go. Nice. Woo. Yeah, that's fun. There he goes. So my fly was drifting uh, quite a bit and I'm running a little bead chain eye because I'm in shallow water and that current's just taking that bead chain eye and pushing it to one side. I can't really run a heavier fly here because it'll spook the fish. So you have to figure out what way the current is going and compensate for that by a few feet. And that helped. I finally kind of figured that out uh, after about four or five missed opportunities so yeah play the current cast upstream let that fly settle into the line that the fish is on I saw it right in this little slack water right here. And uh, it shot out into the deep and I threw a cast out there. I couldn't see it at the moment I cast, but I did see him attack the fly. It was awesome. That was insane. Ah! All right, hopefully I can get this guy landed. And about a 50 pounder was just tracking it. And it was like, oh my gosh, I so wanted this smaller one to come unhooked so then I could go cast at that big one. The big one was like following it to see what the smaller one was feeding on. And it, it was all right here in front of me in this shallow water. And uh, so I'm gonna land this one hopefully right here. And then I'm at a little, mouth of a channel where this incoming tide is just ripping and I'm gonna try to get back out there and see if I can't get that bigger one all right 
here we go i got this gt but the one that was tracking it was like three times this size it was insane so i'm gonna my buddy chad the other host with me is a couple hundred yards away i'm gonna try to get chad up here and get him one of these but yeah this thing is just so cool let me get this guy unhooked and uh, get back out there and try to get the bigger one throw in there again and see if we can't get that big giant one that was tracking around in this uh, channel there's just this rip current coming down into this little back eddy pool right here and uh hopefully we can get him. he's tailing out there there he is okay make your first cast a little short long strip no reaction wrong with my fly really big fish tailing around out there there he is okay laid him by about he's happy I'm just gonna lead him and play it loose one long strip to get his attention and then wait one long strip and wait now he's too far out is tailing again. Got him. Got him. That's a good one, Chad. That's a good one. Oh, yeah. Oh, dude, what? Oh, my God. He's coming back at me. God, that was awesome. He doesn't know where I'm at. Look at him go. Look at him go across that flat. That is awesome. The end of the back. Oh, I'm so sorry to say I lost that fish, but I do want to share with you a little bit of advice that was really helpful in that situation. So that fish was happy and tailing and moving around and there was no big hurry. It wasn't a fish that's just cruising by and I'm going to get one shot. So. It's very important in those situations is just lay your first cast down intentionally a little short and see if that fish will move up to it after one long strip or you you just make a strip and if there's no reaction from the fish you have two options you can wait or you can go in and cast again but that fish was happy to be there so i measured my way in very very carefully and then finally made a really good shot just by carefully taking a second cast if you go to make a second cast lift your rod up and and try to extract that fly very gently from the area so that you don't spook the fish on the lift up but i call it a rangefinder cast first cast short if you need a little more you can always go back in for the second try but you can't catch a spook bonefish so it's best to play it safe Got him. All right. Yeah, that was great. So that was great. I uh, it took me a while to get one here, uh, but finally I was able to spot one coming at me in. I'll try to sync the video up, but I had to do just a little backhand flip. And when you do that little backhand flip, I had that fish come in at like my three o'clock and it was it was only like 20 feet. So I felt like, not a bad bone. God, they're all so strong and so fun to catch. 
but that little backhand flip uh, was necessary because I felt like if I turned my whole body to make a proper cast, the fish would have just not tolerated that much movement. So it was like, whoop, it was a little backhand cast. And that's the thing, you've got to be kind of mentally ready for that. I used to just almost spaz out when I'd see a bonefish up close, I would turn my whole body to try to get in the best position for a shot. And now I, I've got to the point where I can take a deep breath and and uh, utilize that little backhand flip. Ooh, let's get this guy. Nice. First one of day three. Woo! I tried. I try to land him pretty fast. There we go. Look at that guy on that bonefish butter. Nice bony with the little backhand flip cast. Okay, quick tip to follow up about the backhand flip. We've got the wind at our back like this and the light at our back, which is great, but a lot of times that bonefish will come in at like your two or three o'clock. And if I go to turn my whole body, it creates a lot of movement to cast over my right and then the wind is gonna blow that fly into my rod or my body. So you need to be prepared just kind of mentally when you see them on your two and three o'clock as a righty, you could do a little backhand flip and it's real simple. It's just like this. I'm not gonna turn my whole body. I'm just gonna get my cast going like this and then boom. And you wanna give it a good haul so that that actually turns over in the wind and you have a straight tight leader so that your first strip is meaningful. So practice that a few times, even wherever you're watching this, if it's at the desk or at home, just take and practice that backhand flip and then give it a little haul and a little boost at the end so that you get nice leader turnover and a good presentation. Anytime a bonefish shows up at that one, two, three o'clock or even four o'clock somewhat behind you, you wanna go for that little backhand flip. Just real quick, get it going, boom. Just like that, you too can be a bonefish quick shooter. Oh, the old educated blind cast, Chad. Yeah, that was luck. Right there, Joe saw a little explosion when we got on, off the boat. I just threw a blind cast over the edge and... Woo! Ooh. <laughs> the knuckles. You're feeling that one. Watch the knuckles. Yeah, it's a giant trevally on. Yeah, we got super fortunate. We were getting dropped off and just random chance we saw some trevally crash the the beach right here, super lucky. We've seen one all day and just crashed the beach and Chad's kind of crept out there. <laughs> Crank her down a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah, man. Get greedy. Dude, just, that's that Orvis, that new Orvis Helios, Helios D. Yeah, Helios uh, D, eight and a half foot, 10 weight. You like the eight and a half footer? I do, it's quick, fast, um, good quick shots for these GTs where you don't have to throw a, a ton of false casts. Dude, Boy, that's, a pretty, that's a pretty nice one, Chad. This guy's out there a ways. All right, we're gonna check back. The fly line is nowhere in sight. Nice job, Dude, buddy. Okay, we've almost got him. That is a nice one, Chad. Oh, baby, come on. It's kind of deep right here. It's hard to get him. Yeah. Oh, dude. Look at that, baby. Yeah, dude. Might be a little bigger. Lift that baby up. Nice job, dude. The educated blind cast pays off, man. Sweet! Congratulations, Chad. Yeah, That's thank you, man. spectacular, man. Hold it. Beautiful. Yeah, let's let him swim, dude. Such a clean fish. Just perfect. Yeah, they're so cool. <laughs> dude, that was dude, so yeah. awesome, man. Oh. They were coming right at me. Two pretty good sized ones. Come on, turn sideways. No, I need sun. Oh, there's a Trevally. Bluefin Trevally. Come on, there, I ate it, he ate it, I got him. 
Yes, little bluefin. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Golly, that was so cool. Yeah, I could tell they were bluefins because they were just moving so much faster out there. And so you got to vary your, uh, your technique a little bit for those faster moving fish. That was awesome. Hopefully I can get this guy landed. Oh, they're not big, but so strong. So, oh, it's a little G. It's a little GT. I thought it was bluefin. Oh, that's awesome. Little, little giant trevally caught on a bonefish fly. Oh. oh, that was lucky. He came on hook right when I grabbed him, so I got a little GT, but I, I thought it was a blue, blue trevally. Let's let him go. But the blues are going to do the same thing. You might be bonefish fishing, and then all of a sudden a fish or two shows up, and they're just much busier, and they're fast, and they're moving around the flat, and you can mistake them for spooked bonefish. But when you see that, just throw your bonefish fly at it, be way more aggressive because the little trevallies aren't spooky, and then just strip faster, just like a streamer, and they'll pick it up. So you have to you have to change. They won't eat on that real slow bonefish style strip. If they're cruising around like that, just go right at them and strip fast, and you can pick up some trevally on your bonefish fly. So the first thing I do if I'm in a situation where the line uh, needs to be coiled so that I don't step on it or get stuck on the bottom, or I'm not walking into it, is I just take and I, I find my comfortable casting distance, and I say, okay, about that's the furthest I can cast in this situation. And then I just strip it in, strip, 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 strip. So I establish my line length for the conditions first. I keep about a rod length of the actual fly line out, and then I take uh, the two strands here, and I make a little coil, just a small one, and then I extend my arms wider, and I make a little longer coil, and then my last coil is gonna be the longest, and that's also gonna be what I call the tail of the loop, and now I can just carry my tail right here, my other line right here. I can walk around, and I'm not gonna get tangled up, and then when I get a shot at that nice fish or that hopefully a trevally, I can just take the tail and I throw my line out like that. It keeps it nice and organized. My line doesn't tangle up at all when I'm going to make that cast and shoots out nicely and I'm efficient and not tangled up. Okay, one thing uh, about stripping flies for predatory saltwater fish, especially giant trevally, is you can't stop stripping. And it was pointed out this week that a lot of people weren't stripping correctly and I realize I probably didn't share that information. Okay, saltwater flies or fish, saltwater flies can't stop. This strip, stop, strip, stop, strip, stop, strip, stop doesn't really work for saltwater fish. That prey does not stop. It's swimming for its life. So you have two options uh, on how to strip and keep the fly moving. So let's just dump it out there and I actually take the rod and we'll tuck it under my arm and go into a two-handed strip and that's typically my preferred method. Uh, both of the trevally I've landed this week, I've gotten on a two-handed strip. I really like the set. And then I can just drop it out from under my elbow down into my hand. And you get pretty good at it, so I can set it down. And by the time the fly hits, it's under my elbow. It's, it, with a little practice, it's pretty easy. But this one's a little trickier. And uh, it actually works really well. And you also have the ability to pick up and recast really easily. As you strip, you're gonna slide the rod forward and then pull back between strips. So I'm actually sliding the rod forward and I rattle my rod when I do that too. I think that gives it great action just like that. So let me throw it out there again. And uh, it's really helpful if you can see your fly just to practice this, but I'm sliding my rod forward and that way I can drag the fly back, okay? I'm dragging that fly back between strips and it doesn't stop moving and works really well and you can give it some really great action. So I strip and slide my rod forward and slide my rod forward and then I can pull my rod straight back. And then you have a very powerful hook set like that too if they bite right there. But it's very important as well uh, when it comes to acceleration. So let's just talk about that. Say I've engaged with a fish I don't want to start stripping as fast as I can, you know, like so, boom, boom, boom. Because a fly can only accelerate and look natural. It can't, it can't slow down. 
So I like to start slow. And then when, the, when I see the fish is engaged, then I'll start really moving it much faster and accelerate that fly away from the fish, just like real prey would speed up if the fish was, big fish was chasing it. Okay, got a nice looking trigger fish right here. Okay, he's tailing right now. So if he's tailing, I can just put it right on his head. He's gonna eat it, he's following it. He just ate it, he just ate it. He's gonna eat it again, come on. Got him, got him, got him, got him, got him. God, lucky on the trigger again. Lucky on the trigger. Golly, that is just dumb luck. All right, got another trigger fish. Good deal. Hey, I got another trigger fish. That's crazy. There we go. Not quite as big as the other one. I better watch my fingers there. He's trying to freaking bite me. There, got him unhooked. There we go, got another trigger fish. That was cool. Hey, so what happened on that one is when when fish are tailing, and it's true of trigger fish, bone fish, permit, whatever, when they're tailing, their head is down, and so they're not really able to go up and look around. So as soon as he started tailing, I just put my fly right on top of him, and he, he wasn't spooky because his head was down, and he was trying to get a shrimp or a little crab or something out of the sand. So you have an opportunity to cast at the very moment their tail, their head is down and tail is up, that's when you can be much more aggressive and put that shot right in. It's pouring, it's been raining for over an hour. Here's a tip for you, Chad got one. Nice bonefish, don't ever, ever, ever leave the boat without your rain jacket. You could be out here wading a flat for a few hours and you need to have your rain jacket with you at all times. Went from a beautiful day to an absolute deluge. In about two minutes, we could see that storm rolling across the flat. Never leave the boat without your rain jacket. All right, I've been watching Chad put cast after cast, just money shots on these bonefish, and we're having a hard time getting strikes, even though we're making, or he's making perfect casts. Uh, but what we did is there is so much current in here, even though it's only shin deep. Chad dropped this fly in the water a couple of times. He was using just a little set of bead chain eyes and it's just washing away in the current. So we're gonna make a game time adjustment to a much heavier pattern. What are you putting on? Uh, Christmas Island Special, an orange. But with little dumbbell eyes yeah. instead. Twice the sink rate. Yeah, and he threw that one in there, and it, it, it's the smallest fly that he can get to plummet straight to the bottom. So uh, we're going to put that on there, and the shrimp that these bonefish are eating are on the bottom. So if your fly isn't very close to the bottom, they're not going to eat it. If it's just drifting in the current, it just looks like debris. It's not relevant to them at all. So I'm uh, going to switch to a little bit heavier fly, and uh, oh, Chad's already got his crosshairs on one. We'll check back in, let you know how that works. Automatic with that heavier fly, huh? Yeah, yeah, that made all the difference. Yeah, that made all the difference. It took us a little trial and error to figure it out. We're like, man, Chad's making throwing dimes on these fish, and that fly must have been just floating right over the top of them. But uh, that heavier bug, total game changer. You could even see the fish's behavior was totally different. Hey, one more note. Nice job, by the way. Uh, one more note is when you have a lot of current like this, when the fish are looking, they're gonna be, their head is gonna be in the current. They might travel around and go down current and this and that, but when they're looking, they're faced upstream, just like a trout would be in a river. Just make sure and place that fly and lead them on the up current or the up, yeah, upstream side of the fish, because that's the direction they're gonna be looking. Chad's got a hot tip for us. It's just very important. Yeah, so one of the things to look for when you're bone fishing is trying to decipher a bonefish versus a milkfish. And what you look for on a milkfish is black tips on the fins. 
um, and a little smaller profile typically that don't glow as much and stand out as a, a bonefish. We had a school of milkfish out here. We had a couple bonefish in between them. So knowing which one to cast to makes you more efficient. It's going to increase your, your hookup ratio over time. Yeah, and then, uh, yeah, so the black, black tail and it very distinctly fork tail and then the milkfish will float just a little higher in the water column and then uh, they tend to vibrate a little bit more too they're kind of they're kind of quick wanderers whereas the bonefish are much slower and more methodical i would say right right and if you don't know milkfish eat algae they're not shrimp and crab crab eaters or anything so they have a very specific fly to fish for for them in different situations perfect perfect cast He's got it. He's got it. He's about to pick it up. Nice shot. Got him. Dude, nice shot, Chad. Nice shot. Dude, that was just a matter of waiting for it to get light right there. Right. <laughs> oh, yeah. Look at that nice one still right there. Oh, yeah, dude. Dang it. Oh, that's a big one. Dang. There's a bunch of them out there. Holy crap. Bonefish everywhere, and all I've got is this Trevally rod. Uh, so tip there is, like, Chad just sat here, and I kind of snuck over to him, and he just waited and waited and waited. As soon as the lights came on, the bonefish revealed themselves, and it wasn't even a super long cast. It was just right in here, 20, 25 foot cast, and uh, got them. So, yeah, if it's cloudy, just stop. And uh, when the lights come on, then you can either move or make your cast at that point. But your step cadence is incredibly valuable, just knowing when to creep and when to stop, when to creep and when to stop.